We were excited about what happened today. It ended up taking us an hour to get here. We've got some work to continue to do, there is no doubt about it. I don't know how to find the end of the line. I know where my kids are. I, I know they're coming home. I think we could figure something better out. Today, I think, is a win. And right now on the WHAS 1119, take a look, everybody. This is the number you have been waiting to screen see tonight, and we've put it right there on your screen. Seven. 7 o'clock, that's when the last student was dropped off from a JCBS bus tonight on this, the most important first day of school in decades. That beats last year's transportation disaster by three hours when an elementary school student was dropped off at 10 o'clock that night. Here's what Marty Polio said at 7 o'clock tonight. I think we've laid the groundwork for a great year, especially when it comes to transportation. Uh, I will say this on the schools I've been inside of today. I was in four, talked to some of my other staff members who are in multitude of schools too. Just seeing great energy in schools from staff and students. And so we think it's going to be a fantastic year. And there you have it, a much different tone from Marty Polio on not only the first day back to school, but the first day of a major new busing plan for so many people. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'm Doug Prophet. The WHAS 1119 right here has you covered. Our reporters picked up the story this afternoon for the important ride home. So much was riding on it. And the big headline for the redesigned busing plan is going to be those cars. Take a look at this video from the Sky 11 drone hovering over the car rider line at no middle school. The cars barely moving, wrapped around the place at 3.20 this afternoon, dismissal time. No is one of the magnet schools that lost most of its bus service. Well, WHAS 1119 teams Taylor Woods and photojournalist Elijah McKenzie are back at No Live right now with the story of those long lines. And Taylor, you found different reasons for all of the confusion today. Yes, Doug. Well, most parents we talked to today tell us the only hassle was lining up to get through the car rider lines at no middle. Some parents said they were mainly confused about which line to get through, but once traffic started flowing, it was pretty steady. Parents waited in long car rider lines wrapped around no middle school 30 minutes to an hour before dismissal. And that's why I got here early to try to avoid that. I have another child to pick up. It took Kaylee Bell an hour just to get through the line Thursday morning. She says there were three car rider lines at no middle school since students were being dropped off and picked up by grade levels. There's no direction really on which route everybody should take to get to their pickup and drop off points. Um, so it was a little confusing trying to figure out like Am I in the line for no? Bell wasn't the only parent who was confused. Tiffany Prittis also had trouble finding the right line at no middle. Been yelled at, honked at, uh, said, just find the end of the line, honey, and I don't know where that is. She believes most parents are opting to drive their students to school after most families lost transportation this year. And my worry is, oh, I snake around. Am I in the right line? We're all lining up to be released at the exact same time. Eventually, traffic started flowing after a crossing guard intervened. But that wasn't the case at Audubon Elementary. JCPS Chairman Dr. Corey Scholl told WHAS 11 he waited in line two hours. JCPS Superintendent Dr. Marty Polio is now calling on JCPS law enforcement to help with the car ride lines. Our, our police department will help us out with that. We've got to have some traffic control in front of those schools. JCPS families at Englehart Elementary had little to no wait. Probably 10 minutes. Corey Keith gives kudos to JCPS for making transportation smoother this year. The car ride lines are getting really better. Dr. Polio hopes tomorrow will be better and schools will be in a routine by mid next week. Reporting live in Louisville, Taylor Woods, WHAS 11 night team on your side. All right, Taylor, great interviews there, especially that one mom uh, yelled at, honked at. Well, the man at the top of the JCPS Board of Education, believe it or not, was also caught in one of those long lines picking up his daughter. We learned about it in an exclusive interview with Dr. Corey Scholl as he came to WHAS 11 and joined us at 5 right after picking up his daughter. Well, I, my daughter's school dismissed at 3.20, and so I thought that I was sort of beating the rush yeah. by arriving at 2.50. Um, and she got in my vehicle right at 4.44. So wow. about two hours. And so Yeah, it was a, a pretty uh, extensive wait. There you 
There you have it. He waited two hours. Also during our live interview at five, I asked him about last year's after last year's disaster, how he would now grade the new busing plan and this first day back. I give it a, a, a B plus. I think that um, we've up, been up against a lot and Dr. Polio and his team, uh, they've done an exceptional job at meeting the challenges and today I think is a win. Dr. Scholl said that even with his experience of waiting two hours today, parents can expect that car line experience to get better as everything works out in the coming days. So overall, it's being called a success, but JCPS Superintendent Marty Polio said tonight he would not call it redemption. Many parents lost trust in the transportation after last year and still had to use it again today. So those who had kids on the buses today really sweated it out minute by minute. WHAS 11's Travis Breeze and photojournalist Aspen Hester headed to the afternoon bus stops with some parents. And Travis, you had the stopwatch going. That's definitely right, Doug. The parents were very curious what this year was going to look like, and the two families that I spoke to had kids that were 30 and 40 minutes late getting home. They were frustrated, but they feel that they are really counting their blessings if you compare it to last year. I'd probably guess this is gonna be you know, 15 minutes, but we'll see. While golfers played through and cars drove by, David Russ was glued to his phone. He was waiting. And come over here and then come around here. So it'll be coming from that way? Yeah. And waiting. He was using the bus tracking app from last year, Edgelog, to see when his girls would be dropped off at their stop near the Shelby County line. After one false alarm, Different bus. they arrived at 538. Hey girls. Exactly 40 minutes after their scheduled time. Yeah. He says this is way better than last year when taking the bus meant no time for after school activities. Uh, if they can you know, get that down 2010, on time in the next couple of weeks, I'll be pretty happy. In Northfield, Dieta Thomas's son was also 30 minutes late getting home. 30 minutes is nothing compared to what we dealt with last year. Their morning bus didn't come at all last year, causing Thomas to pull both of her kids off the bus for the remainder of the year. Her only gripe this time is that the bus picked up Weston on the far side of the street, so he had to cross where she says people drive too fast. The bus driver said he would flag her complaint. He even you know, yelled out of his window that he would see if he could switch because he realized once he's here, like, wow, this is, this could probably be dangerous. I'm glad to at least be able to put last year's start behind us. You know, I don't know if redeemed is the right word. I feel like we learned a great deal. All the systems we put in place. Parents feeling much better Thursday, but there is room for improvement. I think they will. I mean, I think the biggest hiccup, honestly, is so many more car riders. While the district told us the last student was dropped off at 7 p.m., they also said that 98% of students had been dropped off by 6.30. The president of the bus drivers union told me a few weeks ago he was expecting a 6 p.m. all clear, but they at least got within one hour of that. In the studio, Travis Breeze for the WHS 11 night team on your side. Travis, thank you very much. Well, our coverage on this big day started before sunup this morning on Good Morning Kentuckiana. Polio was right out there before the sunrise at the bus depots. He also told us that 95% of the buses reached school on time this morning, and that means most students were there and did not miss any instructional time on day one. Former bus driver Jamie Owen gave compliments to her former co-workers for a smooth pickup and to the district for the bus overhaul. Everybody's in their compound areas instead of going all over the city. So it's, it was on time and I'm actually pretty confident about it. Yeah. So it, it's, it's going to be a good year. Everything you need for back to school is posted right now on our website, whas11.com. Tomorrow is day two, so we're going to be out there again tomorrow covering those car lines once again. Now to another top story tonight on the night team. Louisville Metro Police admitted today that officers used two types of force at the same time on a Valley Station man, less lethal, and then they also shot him. New body camera video provides those details during an intense confrontation. WHS 1119's Alexandra Goldberg has the video and she's been talking with the attorney for the family. Alexandra? Stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop. stop, stop, stop. Newly released body camera video shows the moments right before Louisville Metro police officers shot and killed a man in Valley Station on July 25th. Those shots fired at the same time police say other officers used less lethal tools. Ultimately, the male charged officers while wielding the butcher knife, prompting the officers to discharge less lethal weapons 
and their firearms, striking the subject multiple times. Watch again from the cameras of the three officers who fired guns in the shooting. Stop! 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 32 year old Joel Napolis Ravello was shot and killed by police at his home on Eaglewood Drive. And the officers were pleading with him for compliance. Um, and they gave multiple opportunities for that. Assistant Chief Emily McKinley says officers went to the house after Joel called 911, requesting medical assistance. I just need to go to the hospital. Now watch here. Put that knife down! No, no. Joel, put that knife down! As officers arrive on the scene, they repeatedly tell Joel to drop a knife during the 15-minute interaction. He put it down on the officer's command at one point. He followed some other commands of the officers. Mike Cooper is the attorney for Joel's family. They just want to get to the bottom line, to the truth. LMPD released this photo of the weapon they say Joel was holding when he ran towards officers. In this freeze frame from the moment before shots were fired. McKinley confirmed less lethal weapons like tasers and rubber bullets were deployed at the same time police fired their guns. Cooper says the family questions why. We had no attempt to really de-escalate the thing or even subdue him through uh, means that were less than lethal. LMPD says that's one question being investigated by the Public Integrity Unit who's handling the investigation. And the three officers involved in the incident were placed on administrative leave per LMPD policy. Live in the studio, Alexandra Goldberg, WHAS 11 Night Team on your side. Alexandra, thank you. The police department also announced a change in their policy for releasing body camera video in shootings. In most cases, they're now going to no longer hold any news conferences after these shootings, instead sharing the videos with pre-recorded messages and their narration. Fireworks in a Nelson County courtroom today when one of the men charged in connection with the death of Crystal Rogers fired his attorney. Steve Lawson accused his attorney of working against him. The prosecutor echoed the concern, calling it disturbing. Teresa Young said her team has noticed some problematic practices and how motions are written, typically doubling down on Brooks Houck's defense instead of Steve Lawson's. Mr. Lavin had a meeting with Brooks Houck's attorneys behind his back. It's come to my attention, I don't think. I'm trying to knock nobody and my attorney's doing his job for me anymore. I can't use his, uh, I don't know what you call it, his counsel, his counsel anymore, sir. I'm sorry. I can't use his counsel anymore, sir. Okay, are you saying that you're wanting a different attorney? Yes, sir, that's exactly what I'm saying, sir. Okay. I'm sorry that I didn't make myself there. Lawson's attorney, Ted Lavitt, quickly left the courtroom at the end of the hearing, not taking any questions from reporters. The judge asked for a public defender to be ready to represent Steve Lawson at the next hearing, where they will once again try to push this case forward. That next hearing is coming up. It is now set for August 22nd. New tonight, New Chapel EMS in Southern Indiana is ending its emergency ambulance services in Clark County. The agency previously run by the former Clark County, Indiana Sheriff Jamie Knoll has been dealt with major staffing issues in the wake of Knoll's arrest. In a news release, New Chapel spokesperson Coy Travis says the agency will stop providing 911 services on September 1st to focus on restructuring and rebranding. They still plan to help with non-emergency runs like transporting somebody from a nursing home. Travis says, quote, we look forward to continuing to play a part, albeit a different part, in providing ambulance services to the citizens of Southern Indiana as we embark on this new course. We have sad news to report tonight about a story we've been following closely. Louisville pilot Chris Moore, missing since Sunday in the Bahamas, was found dead today in his crashed plane. Moore took off from Sebastian Airport on the east coast of Florida Sunday for his three-hour flight to the Bahamas. His wife Stacy Love tells WHAS 11 News that her private rescue crews found him today. The plane was flying. The plane was uh, he was flying was found upright in a marsh. She says he was just two and a half miles away from the small airport when he crashed. He was the only one on board. According to the U.S. Coast Guard, Moore lived near Glenview off River Road in Louisville. He'd been a pilot for nine years.